afternoon uh, today's speaker is professor omsi pratim pingali is an associate professor at ias bangalore professor omsi received phd from stony brook university to, in 2013 his main areas of research includes differential geometry differential analysis several complex variables and mathematical physics and he received numerous awards which includes a president silver medal for the for academic excellence at iit bombay and received chairman's teaching outstanding uh, teaching by the graduate students at stony brook university and awarded early career grant from scrb and he is a junior a junior associate at icpp and awarded infosys young investigator by the infosys foundation and he has written very very nice important articles in popular journals such as annals of annals mm, advances in mathematics mathematics annals transactions of ams journal of partial differential equations madge street international journal of mathematics international mathematical research notices analysis and pde and bulletin der science letters in mathematical physics and communications in mathematical physics and many other important journals with such a brief introduction i request uh, professor omsi to deliver his lectures okay thank you very much uh, for the invitation so i was asked to lecture about conformal maps uh, i assume my colleague ved uh, covered a little bit of polymorphic functions and some people before me covered some more prerequisites uh, so please feel free to interrupt me if i'm going too fast uh, all right so uh, since uh, most of you are teachers or perhaps want to be teachers i think it's important even within even if one is teaching someone who is interested in pure mathematics to uh, to tell them why they need to care about these things okay? so i'll not only try to talk about conformal maps i'll hope i hope i'll convey some sense of why you need to care about them so let's start with that so this is a real world problem suppose we want to recognize the face of a person using a computer what does that mean suppose we have a standard list of faces or maybe let's say we have a standard list of expressions like this uh etc and we are given an expression of some arbitrary person and we want to recognize which of these it corresponds to okay so the point is one possible way to do this is to make a list of faces and see which one matches the given face to match we can attempt to find a map that means from the given face to the list of faces to each of these find a bunch of functions find the map that preserves angles between curves what does this mean what does this phrase mean i'll come to in a moment basically what i mean is if i have two curves here there's an angle theta between them these two curves go to two other curves in each of these and presumably you you can you can match the angle and only one of them okay, for all such pairs of curves okay, i'll just define what that means in a moment okay so that is one real world motivation for the subject of conformal maps another real world motivation comes from cartography or in other words the art of map making right in geography i mean that's where the word map also comes from right the map in your atlas of uh, some part of the earth so back in the day people used to travel by ships and so they if you if this is india and let's say this is the african con continent etc if you wanted to go from here to here you you would have had to go by by a ship and at each point on your journey to know the directions you had to keep track of your compass or the stars or something so basically you needed a, a way to know wh which way to steer your ship right so you needed a map of the globe what is a map a map is simply a function from a piece of paper to the earth and the point is that 
ideally you would want at least the angles between these vertical lines to be preserved presumably you want these to go to longitudes and these to go to latitudes for example you want the angles to be preserved so that is why people were interested in conformal maps long ago okay anyway another point another reason to care about what we are going to do is the following consider the following equation not to worry if you don't understand these two points if you don't understand the slide very well that's okay it's just motivation for what we are going to do so consider this equation suppose you have a bound, a domain in the complex plane and you want to find a function whose laplacian is zero what is the laplacian it is d square u dx square plus d square u dy square right so you want a function that satisfies the laplacian being zero and on the boundary you want u to be equal to g okay uh, so, so this equation arises by the way i i really hope i'm audible uh you're a, yes you're okay, okay, okay. one for one for, sorry because uh, yesterday I gave a talk and suddenly my internet conked off. That's why. Okay. Right. So anyway, so this equation arises in electrostatics, meaning that if you have a bunch of charges, suppose you have a, let's say, a metallic plate and you take, not a metal, and a metallic boundary and you 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 connect the boundary to a battery or some such thing then the potential the electrostatic voltage on this insulator will satisfy the sort of an equation roughly speaking okay, it arises in various other places like heat conduction fluid mechanics various places okay so this is an important partial differential equation from the perspective of real life it's also an important part, partial differential equation from the perspective of pure mathematics, but we can't get into that, unfortunately. Okay? So solving this explicitly, that is, writing a formula for the solution is impossible for general omega. At best, if you have a lot of symmetry, then you can hope to do something, but otherwise it's impossible. Right? So the best we can do is to solve it for a very symmetric domain, namely a disk of radius 1, uh, sorry, uh, oops, for some reason this thing is not writing, but anyway, you can solve it for a disk of radius 1 uh, centered at the origin, yeah, okay, using a formula. So the real question is, is there a way to convert that solution to the case where you have a general domain omega, okay, so that is the real question. Yeah, so the, our aim is therefore to study angle preserving maps. To answer both of these questions, we need to study these things called angle preserving maps. What are angle preserving maps? I'll define that concept in a moment. Okay. Uh, sorry, my touch screen is. Uh, ah, but I can use my finger apparently. So when I say angle preserving, I'll define it in a moment. But the idea is if I have a map between two domains, it's called angle preserving. If whenever I take two curves here, they'll go to two other curves here, and the angle between these two curves must be the same. Okay? Right. So for references, we shall follow parts of a Stein, Shakarchi, Alfors, and uh, this book by Remert, mostly. But, but yeah, it's, it, this uh, material is drawn from various places, but it's very standard. I'm sure you can find it anywhere. All right, so let's uh, get down to business. What is an angle preserving map? So suppose uh, omega is an open set. Uh, just excuse me for a moment. Let me just try to see if uh, this is not working. All right, let me suppose omega is an open set. Yeah. Uh, suppose gamma 1 of t and gamma 2 of t are unit speed differentiable paths. What that means is you have two nice curves here. One of them is gamma 1 of t, the other is gamma 2 of t. 
their units, they're differentiable. That means that the velocity vector for each of these curves makes sense for all uh, time. The unit speed, that means if you find the magnitude of this vector, for both of them, it is one for all time. Okay. So suppose you have these in omega that pass through a point P. So these two things pass through a point P that is at t equals zero, for example, gamma one of zero and gamma two of zero are both P, and the velocity, the speeds are always one. Okay. Suppose that's the case. The tangent vectors at P are gamma one prime of zero and gamma two prime of zero. These are both vectors. They're both tangent vectors, right? Suppose the angle between them is theta. Okay, so you have two tangent vectors corresponding to these two parts. Suppose the angle between these two is theta. Okay, so if the angle between two unit speed vectors is theta, then if you take a dot product of these two vectors, it is magnitude of the first one times the magnitude of the second one times cos theta. But both of these magnitudes are one. So this is just gamma one prime dot, dot gamma two prime at zero is cos theta. Yeah. Now let's make a, uh, likewise, if you take cross product, gamma one prime zero cr cross gamma two prime zero, the magnitude of this is gamma one times one times sine theta, right? Magnitude of sine theta, but suppose we don't take the magnitude, suppose we take just gamma one prime cross gamma two prime, it's sine theta times k hat, right? Okay, so definition. A map from uh, this open set to C is said to be angle preserving at a point P. If firstly it is C1 at P, I hope everyone understands what C1 means. C1 simply means that the partial derivatives of F uh, with respect to X and Y. Oh, so it's a map from omega to C. So th there are two components. F is U plus IV. Both functions u and v, their partial derivatives exist, and they're, they're continuous. Okay, that's what c1 means. So if it is c1 at p and this following uh, complicated expression holds, and this complicated expression is not saying anything fancy, what do we want really? You see, sorry, uh, let me just erase this. This is gamma 1 of t. This is gamma 2 of t, right? So what does this f do? It takes this to one curve, right? And this also to another curve. And these two curves intersect at f of p, because p goes to f of p, right? What we want is the angles between the tangent vectors to be the same. So the tangent vectors for these two are gamma 1 prime of 0 and gamma 2 prime of 0, respectively. What about the tangent vectors for these two curves? It's simply the derivative of f of gamma 1 of t at 0 and f of gamma 2 of t at 0. Right? We want these two to be same. What does this mean? We want this, if this angle is theta and this vector is a and this vector is b, then a dot b is mod a times mod b times cos theta, right? And cos theta is simply gamma prime 1 of 0 and gamma prime 2 of 0. So if you divide by mod a and mod b, this equation will be true, OK? Likewise, we want the same for the cross product. That means we want this cross this to be equal to the magnitude of this times the magnitude of this times uh, this this cross this. OK, this is what we want. So that means cos theta and sine theta are both equal. And theta is between 0 and 2 pi. So that means the angles are equal. OK, so this is the definition of a conformal. Uh, this is the definition of a, an angle preserving map. It's said to be angle preserving at a point if this happens. All right? Right. So in particular, to make sense of the word angle between tangent vectors, uh, 
the denominator here should not be zero. So as a part of the definition, this should not be zero for any unit speed curve. Okay. So I hope the definition of angle preserving is clear. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. So here's an example. As soon as one presents a definition, one must give examples and non-examples, right? If one can't do it, then there's no point of the definition, right? So here's an example of a map, first of all, from C to C, namely f of z is e raised to z. Uh, I hope uh, this exponential map was covered in previous lectures. So f of z is e raised to z. I claim it as angle preserving at the point z equals zero. So how does one prove that? Well, suppose you take a curve gamma of t, gamma of t is x of t comma y of t. X and y are both functions of time, right? So now uh, the image, the, the curve in the target is going to be f of gamma of t which is e raised to gamma of t, which is e raised to x of t plus i y of t, which is e raised to x of t times e raised to i y of t, which is simply e raised to x cos y, comma, e raised to x sine y, right? So if you take the derivative with respect to time, you can easily differentiate using the, the chain rule and the product rule to get this expression, e raised to x, x prime cos y minus e raised to x, x sine y, y prime, and likewise for the other coordinate. Now at, uh, at z equals 0, at the point where z equals 0, notice that, uh, notice that sine y is 0, because y is 0, right? And x is 0, so that is simply x prime comma y prime, right? OK, so the dot product for two such curves is simply x, this dot this, right? But what is this dot this? This is exactly the same as the dot product for the original curves gamma 1 and gamma 2, right? Because the derivative of gamma 1 prime is this vector. The derivative of gamma 2 prime is this vector. So the dot products are the same. Likewise, the cross products are also the same. I hope this is clear. Okay, this is a very elementary example. So this example shows that e raised to z is an is an indeed an angle preserving map at z equals zero. Okay. So here is a non-example, something that is not an example of an angle preserving map. F of z equals z bar. So why is this an not an example of an angle preserving map? I'll leave you to think about it. In other words, come up with two curves such that the angle between these two curves changes under this map. Okay? It's not very hard to do, so please think about it. All right, so I hope the definition of an angle preserving map is now clear. All right. And I also hope from the previous slide, it's clear as to why we care about angle preserving. So if you've noticed, this should be a very familiar sort of a function to you. It's an example of a holomorphic function. So the question is, is there a deep relationship between preserving angles and being holomorphic or being analytic, whatever term you prefer? Okay. All right, so more on angle preservation. So let's uh, analyze this more carefully. So suppose w is f of z which is u plus iv, u and b are functions of x and y. By the chain rule, if you take the derivative of f with respect to time, that is u prime plus iv prime, what is u prime? So du dt, if you will, is simply du dx dx dt plus du dy dy dt. Yeah? Likewise for v, all right? Therefore, by definition, a C1 map f is angle preserving at p if and only if 
the following happens. So what are these complicated looking expressions? What, are, what do they talk about? Uh, basically, what do we want? So you have two curves here. I'm so sorry. So they go to two other curves here. This is gamma 1 and this is gamma 2. This is f of gamma 1 and this is f of gamma 2. What do we want? We want the tangent vectors, the dot product between these two, to be the same as the dot product between the tangent vectors here. Likewise for the cross product, right? So what is the uh, what is the dot product between these two? What is this vector? Uh, the what is this tangent vector? It is simply u1 prime comma v1 prime. The tangent vector for this one is u2 prime comma v2 prime. What is the dot product between these two? It is this times this plus this times this, right? That is the numerator divided by the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector, that better be equal to this one, the dot product between these two, okay? Let us assume that these are unit speed vectors. That means square root of x1 prime square plus y1 prime square is one, and likewise for x2 prime and y2 prime. Similarly, the cross product condition boils down to this particular equation, okay? So you have two equations. So what do we want? We want these two equations to be satisfied for all curves, x1, y1, x2, y2, that are of unit speed, okay? So we want, it to be, we want them to be satisfied for all curves, right? So if you substitute these expressions here and here, you will see that for this equation, you'll get this, uh, when you substitute here, you'll get this complicated look looking equation. And for this, you'll get another equation that I was too lazy to write down, right? So uh, this is a fairly complicated looking equation, right? This equation better hold for all curves of the type x1 of t comma y1 of t and x2 of t comma y2 of t that are of unit speed, right? So this is too painful, right? I mean, uh, how can we draw any conclusion? So let's attempt to take baby steps by at least making sure that this equation, if, so it's angle preserving at P, if, if and only if this is true for all such curves. So in particular, suppose it is angle preserving at P, it better be true for these two special kinds of curves. What are they? They are the x-axis and the y-axis. At the very least, the angle between the x-axis and the y-axis should be preserved, right? So what is the x-axis? The x-axis consists of i cap, that is x1 prime is 1, y1 prime is 0, right? For the y-axis, x2 prime is 0, but y2 prime is 1. So let us substitute these two here in this equation, and let us see what will happen, okay? Then these equations simplify. So before that, uh, I mean, we can directly substitute here or we can calculate this and substitute here. Whatever you want to do, at the end of the day, what happens is the following. Uh, you will get these two equations, okay? From this, you will get this. From this, you will get this. Okay, let us just verify whether I am telling you the truth or I've, I'm just lying. So let us uh, substitute x1 prime as 1 and x2 prime as 0 here so that this will be 0. This goes away. Likewise, this will be 0. Okay. This x1 prime times y2 prime will be 1 and this will be 0. So you'll get this plus this. Uh, what about this? This will again be zero. The angle between the x-axis and y-axis is 90 degrees. So indeed, this is correct. For the cross product, I invite you to verify it yourself, okay? So upon solving these two equations, we see that Vy is given by this formula and Uy is given by this formula. This, this is very close to something very familiar. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question here. What, what are these two equations? Why, why am I saying that they should be somewhat familiar? Not exactly, but 
Why should they be familiar? Or at least some version of these? Sir, it's like a Kojirimani person with some concept. Very good. Very good. Very good. So it, uh, except for this proportionality factor, these are just basically the Cauchy Riemann equations, right? And in fact, what are what happens if the Cauchy Riemann equations hold? What happens is that this proportionality factor becomes one. Why? Because what are the Cauchy Riemann equations? Ux equals by. So this will become by. And Vx is minus Uy. So this will become minus Uy, right? So the, this proportionality factor becomes one if the Cauchy Riemann equations were true. So we are very close, right? So let's uh, let's see. So so what we can do is we can we can use this simplification to simplify our equations further, right? So using these equations within this, I claim, and I invite you to do these calculations yourselves. In fact, when you teach these things to your students, I would advise you to make someone come up to the board and try to substitute this here and see what will happen. That might be an effective way of teaching, but then it's up to you. It's your, your style of teaching. right? So thus, uh, this equation holds for all unit speed curves. Yeah? And so, uh, so does this. So now what we'll do is we have not used the full strength of this uh, of these equations. We just took preserving angles between the x-axis and the y-axis. Ideally, what we should do is at least make sure that the angle between the x-axis and any other curve is preserved, right? At least we should do this. So let's do that. So take the first curve to be the x-axis, no problem. The second curve to be some other straight line. but with unit speed. So a squared plus b squared equals 1. So you, when you substitute that here, what will happen? x prime is 1, y prime is 0. Wherever y prime appears, so this goes away. y1 prime, wherever it appears, this goes away. right? But x1 prime is 1, x2 prime is a. So let's uh, substitute. So this is a. right? So this is a. This goes away. Uh, this goes away. So this is also a, and this times this. What is this? We can we can calculate that. That's this. What's this? That's this, right? So these a's get cancelled out, and you'll get this equation. Okay, this is true for all a and b such that this happens. Therefore, if you square on both sides, I mean, you don't even have to square on both sides. I mean, first of all, this becomes a square root. Now square on both sides. And compare the coefficients of a and b. So, so, so basically, or rather, let's take just a to be 0 and b to be 1. Then you'll see that ux squared plus bx squared is uy squared plus by squared. So in other words, going back, the proportionality factor is actually just 1. So lo and behold, you have the Cauchy-Riemann equations uh, over here. Right? Wonderful. So what have we proven so far? We have proven that suppose a map is angle preserving, then the Cauchy Riemann equations hold. So, if the Cauchy Riemann equations hold, is it angle preserving? That, that will be an exercise that you will do on your own and will be discussed in your tutorial session. Okay? The other way around, that it, this, this much is enough. Right? In other words, a C1 function is angle preserving at all points of omega if and only if f is holomorphic on omega and the derivative is not zero everywhere. So being angle preserving is exactly the same as being holomorphic, that is analytic, and the derivative is not zero everywhere. Why do you want the derivative to not be zero everywhere? Because recall that in the notion of angle preserving, we also needed this. Okay, we needed this. Okay, because it doesn't make sense to ask what angle does the zero vector make with anything. Right? So that's why. The derivative must be non-zero everywhere, and it should be a holomorphic function. Okay. All right. So by the way, this is 
perhaps one way of caring, one reason to care about holomorphic functions in the first place. I don't know if anyone told you why to care about holomorphic functions. This is one reason. There are other reasons, but yeah. Okay. So wonderful. So I hope this much is clear. Right. So let's move on. Any questions so far? Sir, why we are considering always by units speed curves for simplicity for the calculus? Sorry, sorry, I didn't get you. Why we are uh, taking unit, unit speed curves only? Ah, ah, that is simplicity of calculation. You're absolutely right. Okay. Even if you don't take unit speed curves, you can just normalize. Yes. And if it is true for unit speed curves, it's true for any other velocities. Yeah. Any other questions before I move on? All right, wonderful. Let's move on. OK, so what happens if f prime is 0? I mean, I said that it should be holomorphic and f prime is non-zero everywhere. Why is this non-zero condition made? Because it doesn't make sense to talk about what happened, what is the angle between the zero vector and anything else. That is true. Even this notion doesn't make sense. But can we get a geometric picture of what really happens when f prime is zero? Right? Let's look at an example. Once again, I find it an effective thing to give examples whenever you introduce, ask any question to explore what's going on. Do you, do you know of any example of a holomorphic function which a non-constant holomorphic function whose derivative is zero at some point. Any example? At some point. So sine, yes. any sine z constant function. For instance, sine z, but a simpler example perhaps? Polynomial. So z is squared. Very good, very good. Z squared, that's the one I had in mind. So of course, the notion of angle preservation does not make sense if f prime is 0. But, but we want to investigate further. We, we don't want to give up by saying it doesn't make sense. We want to see what actually goes wrong. So here's an example, as someone suggested, take f of z equals z squared. Well, that's the simplest example, f prime is 0 at z equals 0. So what happens to angles, by the way? If I take f of z equals z squared, if I take two curves, what do you think happens to the angles between them? They are not going to be preserved. That doesn't even make sense. But roughly, what, what do you think happens? Twice, it becomes twice. Excellent. The angles are rotated by twice the amount. For example, if I take the x-axis and the y-axis, the, the y-axis goes to the negative x-axis. So this becomes 180 degrees. Right? So some sort of rotation seems to happen. Okay. All right. Anyway, the other thing we note, the other curious part about f of z equals z squared is it is not one to one. Right? In fact, that's what's happening here. So it's not one to one. So the other thing that we note is that the function f of z equals z squared is not one to one near the origin. So if we demand that f of z, if f is a one-to-one -one function near a point z naught, does it follow for free that f prime of z naught is non-zero? This is the question. Okay. So what we want to check is suppose we say that f is one-to-one. -one. So f prime not being zero is a very annoying condition to deal with, right? On the other hand, being one-to-one -one or not is a slightly better condition. So it's something that we can visualize more easily. So if a function, holomorphic function is one to one, is f prime z, z not non-zero? First of all, notice that this is not an obvious statement because such a statement is definitely spectacularly false for real functions, for non-holomorphic functions. Do we have an example? Do you have an example? Of x, one, x, is cube. x cube, excellent. So if you take x cube, it's one to one, but at the origin, the derivative is zero, right? So this is very, very false for one variable real functions. However, the analog of that in complex variables, this is not one to one near the origin, right? 
So that's the difference. In fact, this statement is true. So proposition. If f from omega to c is holomorphic and one to one near a point z naught, then f prime of z naught is not zero. By the way, when I say near a point z naught, I mean it is one to one in an open disk uh, around z naught. That open disk can be as small as you want, but it has to be an open disk. Okay. Right. So this, uh, this. Uh, so what is roughly speaking what is going on? Uh, if f prime of z naught is zero, roughly speaking, not exactly, but roughly speaking, f of z looks like z minus z naught raised to some power, roughly speaking. And we know this is not one to one, right? So that is what goes wrong, really. Okay. So this is basically this is the worst that can happen in some sense. Okay. But to prove it rigorously is not easy. Okay? One way to prove it, and that will be a part of your homework, is after we do the open mapping theorem. But another way to prove it uh, is something I'll sketch here. But if you don't understand, not to worry. But it's, uh, it's, it's nice to see such a thing. So first of all, if you take, uh, suppose you take a curve, a simple closed curve C. And if you calculate this integral, this contour integral, f prime z dz divided by f of z minus f of a. I claim it is the number of zeros of f of z minus f of a that, are, that lie within c. When is this zero? When f of z equals f of a. For example, let's take an example. Suppose f of z equals z, and let's say a equals zero. Then this is simply integral of dz divided by z. I mean, up 1 over 2 pi i. I forgot the 1 over 2 pi i. Please excuse me. So it's actually this. What is this equal to? This is equal to 1 if 0 lies in the curve. And it is equal to 0 if 0 lies outside the curve. So this is exactly counting when this function uh, equals f of a inside the curve how many times suppose instead of taking z if i take z squared then what happens let's let's look at this suppose i look at the same sort of an example uh, once again i forgot that one over two pi i so if i take f of z as z squared then i'll get two z dz and let's say a is zero as usual as before then i'll get this that's two over z and the integral of this is going to be equal to two so in other words, this counts the number of zeros of f of z minus f of a up to multiplicity. I mean, not up to, including the multiplicity that lie in this curve. How does one prove this? Uh, that's, it's not very hard, but it's not very easy either. It's called the argument principle. If you want to look it up on Wikipedia or any textbook, for instance, argument principle. OK, all right. So assuming that this argument principle is true, this integral depends continuously on A. So how does one prove it depends continuously on A? Well, that requires a little bit of work. Uh, but anyway, so for A equals Z naught, this number becomes more than 1 if f of f prime of Z naught is no, 0. Why does it become more than 1? I'll again leave that to you as an exercise. Okay. So this is just a sketch of the proof. I don't expect you to, I mean, if you don't want to prove it for your students and all, that's perfectly okay. But uh, just for our knowledge. Okay. Anyway, the bottom line is the result itself that if f is holomorphic and one to one near a point, then f prime is non zero over there. The converse is false. Okay. If f prime is not 0 at near a point, uh, that I mean, rather, if f prime is non 0 on all of C, that does not mean that f is 1 to 1 on all of C. Okay? The converse, as in, maybe I should have, shouldn't have said that. W what I mean by the converse is if f prime is non 0 everywhere, that does not mean f is one to one. 
the converse of this statement is still correct as in if f prime of z naught is non zero then near a point it is still one to one but if you say f prime is not zero everywhere that doesn't mean f is one to one everywhere okay so that's what i mean by the statement so do we have an example take e raised to z okay so e raised to z uh, the derivative is not zero everywhere yet it is not one to one everywhere okay all right Okay, so where am I heading with all of this? The above discussion shows that holomorphic one-to-one -one maps are angle preserving. Why? Because holomorphic one-to-one -one maps have non-zero derivative. Okay? Right. So for the facial recognition problem, remember this problem, list of faces? For that, we would also need the inverse to be angle preserving. Okay, we need to be made with map in both directions, and we would want the inverse to be angle preserving also. Okay, so uh, we are faced with the following question If F is a one to one holomorphic map, okay, so first of all, for the inverse to be angle preserving, notice that whenever we talk about calculus or holomorphic functions or or anything, we would, we would always want the domain to be an open set. The domain should always be an open set, right? In particular, we want the inverse's domain, which is f of omega, we want this also to be an open set. Is this true in the first place? So if f is a holomorphic one-to-one -one map from omega to c, is the image f of omega an open set in the first place? And if it is open, is the inverse actually holomorphic? Okay. So the answer to both of these questions is yes. Thankfully, yes. Okay. But let's at least try to understand first whether f of omega is open or not. Okay. So that's the content of the open mapping theorem. A non-constant holomorphic map takes open sets to open sets. It is crucial that it, it be non-constant because obviously a constant map takes an open set to just a point and a point is not an open set, right? So this is the open mapping theorem of complex analysis. It might seem like just a mere curiosity, but it's actually very deep and I'll show you a couple of applications of it soon. For instance, one can prove this proposition using the open mapping theorem, as you will see in your homework. Okay, that's a very important uh, theorem. All right. Now, whenever I state a theorem in complex analysis, you should compare it with ordinary one-variable calculus to see if you, there is an analog or not. Okay, that will help you understand the differences and similarities. It's important to gain a deep understanding that way. So the real version of this theorem is false. If that is, if I have a one-to-one -one differentiable function from an open subset of real numbers, it's a real valued one-to-one -one differentiable function, that does not mean that its image is one is an open set. I mean, uh, sorry. That is not correct. That is that is uh, that is true. What is not true is sorry. Sorry. What what do I mean? Uh, if you have a one-to-one -one differentiable function from uh, an open set of real numbers to itself, the inverse is not necessarily differentiable. Yeah, sorry. This is what I mean. Do we have a counterexample? Do you know of examples of one-to-one -one differentiable functions whose inverses are not differentiable? X cube. X cube, exactly. Or X squared, f of x is X squared, right? The, the inverse is square root of x and square root of x is not differentiable at x equals zero, okay? However, the, the answer to this question by the way, is f of omega open? That is surprisingly true 
And you don't even need it to be differentiable. Even one-to-one -one continuous functions do take open sets to open sets. And this is a difficult theorem to prove. In one variable, it's not very difficult. But in, this is true even in more than one variable, and it's hard to prove. It's called the invariance of domain, and it requires uh, lots of mathematics to prove. It's not easy. Okay, So this particular part is still true. In the holomorphic context, it's easier to prove. All right. OK, so proof of the open mapping theorem. What's an open mapping theorem? The open mapping theorem has nothing to do with being even one to one. Any holomorphic map that is not constant takes open sets to open sets. So how does one prove it? Suppose, so suppose I have this, and suppose there's an open set. That means, uh, let's say that suppose f of z naught, suppose this is the case. Of course, this is W naught. This goes to W naught. What I want to say is everything near W naught, an open subset, uh, an open disk around W naught, will be in the image of F. That means if I take anything in a small enough open disk around W naught, some W, there should exist some Z here so that F of Z is W. As long as W is close to W naught. This is what we want to prove. Okay. Since f is not a constant, there is a small open disk, and I'm calling this open disk U, such that the closed disk is completely contained in omega. So z naught is here. There is some open disk U whose which is completely whose such that the closed disk U is completely contained in omega. So that over here, f of z is not equal to z naught anywhere else. Why is this correct? How does one prove that this is correct? I mean, I don't know whether the re requisite uh, theorem has been covered for you, but let's see. How does one prove this sort of a statement? So inside a ball, it should have only finitely many zeros. Absolutely. Very good. So basically, first of all, f of z equals uh, f of z naught equals w naught. It it has a fine. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the the set of all f of z such that f of z equals w naught. This set, if you take any uh, any finite sized ball, it has only finitely many zeros in it. Why? Because if it has infinitely many zeros, then it has the C set of zeros has a limit point, and that is not allowed okay, in complex analysis. So if it is not a constant, that means this is true. This is so if it is a constant, then this is false, right? So this is the only place where we are using the assumption that it's not a constant. Okay. All right, great. So nowhere else on this ball is f of z equal to w. Right. What we need to show is that for all W close enough to W naught, f of z equals W for some z in U. So what we need to show to prove that it's an open map, to show that the image is an open set is if I take some small enough open disk around this, for all such things, there is some z so that f of z equals this. Okay, that's what we want to show. So suppose that's not true. What does that mean for it to not be true? No matter how close you get to w naught, there is a counterexample to this statement, right? That is, there exists a collection of w n that get arbitrarily close to w naught. In other words, there's a sequence of w n's converging to w naught such that f of z minus w n is not equal to 0 for all z in u. Okay? And we will produce a contradiction to this statement. So this means that if you take 1 by z f of z minus w n, 
this is a sequence of functions g n of z the denominator is never zero on u in fact it's never zero on the bound on u closure okay on, on the closed disk not just on u in fact i can say this is true okay it's uh, holomorphic on u and continuous on u closure for all n why because the denominator is non zero now comes the key point and in all the these proofs the the, the starring actor the rajnikanth of this movie if you will uh, or depending on where you're from like what amir khan or whoever you like but is the maximum modulus principle okay what does the maximum modulus principle state that if you take a holomorphic function on some open set omega that extends continuously to the boundary the maximum of this holomorphic function is attained on the boundary and in fact it cannot be attained on the interior unless this function is a constant right so we know this is not a constant so this does attain its maximum on the boundary and cannot attain it in the interior sir yeah to use maximum modulus principle we need our domain to be bounded on absolutely this is a disk this is a closed disk right okay yeah good yeah. so since mod f of z minus w is never zero on the boundary right because this is never zero we see that for large n this is bounded so if this is never zero right and w n converges to w not it's easy to see that this stays away from zero on the boundary for all large enough n so 1 divided by that is bounded okay for some c independent of n but that's a problem why because if you substitute z not here yeah if you substitute z not you get 1 by f of z not minus n which goes to infinity right because this goes to zero right so that is false that's the problem i hope this contradiction is clear so we claim that 1 by f of z minus w and better be bounded independent of n but when you substitute z not it's not bounded that means our original assumption is false and that means this is true that proves the open mapping theorem all right so let's uh, move on so why do we care about the open mapping theorem for example there is no non constant holomorphic function on c whose image is a part of the real line that means its image is completely contained in the real line one way to prove it is using cauchy riemann equations another way to do it is using the open mapping theorem which you will do as a homework problem Okay. Another application of the open mapping theorem is that it shows that the inverse of a one-to-one -one holomorph. So first of all, f of omega is an open set for a one-to-one -one holomorphic map. Secondly, the inverse I claim is actually holomorphic. It is continuous, and in fact, it is holomorphic. so the open mapping theorem is enough to prove that the inverse is continuous okay very quickly why is that enough why is the open map yeah it's an open map okay so therefore if inverse if inverse will be continuous right i mean so so that's because what is continuity the if inverse, inverse of, of inverse of some g yes will be f of g and that is open that is open very good okay right so it's continuous that part follows from the fact that it's an open map the fact that f inverse is itself holomorphic is not easy okay that is not that does not follow from the open mapping theorem uh so the point is first of all you can use the open mapping theorem to prove that f prime of z is never zero if you have a one to one holomorphic map and that would be a part of your homework 
if you do if you assume that fact and this thing called the inverse function theorem then this is true okay, this is one way to prove it but i understand may, some of you may not have seen the inverse function theorem and even if you have there's no way to prove it for the students right it's too much for undergraduates especially so one way and again this proof is also difficult and i don't expect you to pay too much attention to it but that's okay yeah it's just for general knowledge it's a very cute little proof the first thing you do is you find a formula for the inverse and then you prove that it is holomorphic using this formula so why does this formula work so this formula is f inverse of w is this where c is a circle so if i take any point p and c is a circle uh, where f of z is not zero on the circle okay so using an appropriately chosen contour you can get a formula for the inverse now i don't remember if i gave this to you as a homework problem but one can prove this it's not it's again not very hard but it's not trivial either uh i won't prove this for you uh try to do it if you have any questions you can email me i'll answer them but but anyway okay so once you have this formula now it's very reasonable to expect that this f inverse of w is holomorphic in w because this thing doesn't depend on w bar right it's holomorphic in w for the same reason that uh, the cauchy integral formula gives you holomorphic functions okay so the integrand is analytic in w one way to do it is using a geometric series okay so this integrand is holomorphic in w that's easy one can then prove that if you write a geometric series for this you can in interchange integration and summation and get a power series for this that requires a little bit of work one way to do it is using uniform convergence and weierstrass and test and so on but if you don't know those things or don't care but that's okay the point here is the result itself rather than the proof right okay so before we go on move on to conformal maps any questions so far all right so let's move on okay so to summarize angle preserving maps are precisely holomorphic maps with nowhere zero derivative right moreover one to one holomorphic maps do have nowhere zero derivative and inverses of one to one holomorphic maps are also holomorphic this is what we have done so far in particular so one to one holomorphic maps are angle preserving and their inverses are also angle preserving this is the crux of what we have done so far this statement so if you are someone who in, who is interested in map making that is uh, drawing a map of a part of the earth uh, on a piece of paper i mean you would definitely be interested in maps that are angle preserving so holomorphic maps do the job for example one to one holomorphic maps okay so let's so whenever you see a concept that plays an important role in various aspects of mathematics you you just make it into a definition so let u and v be open sets in the complex plane a map f from u to v is said to be conformal conformal means angle preserving by the way i mean the 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 english meaning in some sense is that but it's not exactly angle preserving in this sense it's conformal if it is one to one onto that means its inverse exists and it is holomorphic so it is certainly angle preserving but in addition to that it is one to one also so its inverse is also angle preserving so if f is conformal f inverse from v to u is also conformal so conformal maps are one to one uh, uh, holomorphic maps okay all right that is a conformal map is a is what is sometimes called a biholomorphism 
That means it's a holomorphic map. Its inverse exists, and its inverse is also holomorphic. So it's holomorphic in both directions, and that's why it's called a biholomorphism. Okay? That's, a, that's the terminology used sometimes by some textbooks. And if U and B are both the same open set, a conformal map is also called an automorphism. The word auto means uh, it's self-driven, right? Like automatic, for instance. So an automorphism is a biholomorphism of a set to itself. Okay? So that's also another piece of terminology. Sometimes people write this symbol to mean the collection of all automorphisms of U, meaning it's the collection of all conformal maps from U to itself. This set is sometimes denoted as ought of U. Okay? There is more than one conformal map from a, an open set to itself, by the way. It's not obvious. I mean, if there is a conformal map, there's more than one. Okay? So what's an example of a conformal map? The simplest example is f of z equals a z plus b. Okay, it's a con where a is non-zero. If a is zero, it's a constant, and therefore it's not a conformal map. So where a is non-zero, it's a conformal map from c to itself. Okay, so it's obviously a one-to-one -one holomorphic map from c to itself. Right? Basically, what are you doing here? You're taking z. Multiplying by the complex number A, what does multiplication by complex number A do? First of all, it scales distances by mod A, right? Excuse me, one second. <coughs> right, sorry. So it scales distances by mod A, and, and, um, and it rotates, right? So AZ, this part is scaling plus rotation. This is translation. So you're moving the origin. This is translation, OK? This is an example. Here is one more example. F of Z equals 1 by Z. Now you might immediately object saying at Z equals 0, you have a problem. That's right. So the domain is not all of C. It is C minus the origin, and it goes to C minus the origin. It's a one-to-one -one map. It is holomorphic, so it's a conformal map. Okay. But the point is, so see, this is this this is the place where sometimes physicists score over mathematicians. That uh, I mean, most often mathematicians would stop at this point, but you can actually go a little further. We can extend it to infinity. See, normally in mathematics, we are afraid of the word infinity. But in complex analysis, we shouldn't be so afraid. Okay? Because suppose, so how would you define f of z? How would you define this thing at infinity? It would simply be a times infinity plus b. So morally speaking, it should be infinity itself. right? What about here? How should we define f? At infinity, it's 1 over infinity. We should define it to be 0. And how should we define f of 0? We should define it to be infinity. Okay. Now, when, as soon as I say this, this should be a little dangerous. Remember, in one variable calculus, if I take f of x equals 1 by x, what is the limit of this as x goes to 0? Exist. Why exist? not? Why why is it not infinity? It may go to plus infinity or minus ha, infinity. That is an ex excellent point. So the problem here is you have plus or minus infinity. But then the same problem should occur in complex analysis also. No? So what is going on? What, why am I saying this infinity? Uh, I mean, yeah? In, in complex, we do not have the plus minus things. Maybe, but you do still have directions, right? It could go to infinity in in any direction. Like it can go to infinity like this, like this, like this. You, the situation is far worse in complex analysis, in fact. Right? 
So there's, there's a very neat trick here that makes this work that was recognized by Riemann. And that is the following. The infinity is a curious number, firstly. When I say number, I must put it in quotes. Naively, we would like to think that no subsequent, if no subsequence of Zn converges, then Zn must converge to infinity. That is, suppose a subsequence of Zn converges, and of course Zn does not converge to infinity. In fact, if Zn is not bounded, right? If if Zn is if Zn has a bounded subsequence, any bounded subsequence has a convergent further subsequence. That's called a bolzano weierstrass theorem. So if no subsequence of Zn converges, Zn must morally converge to infinity. This is one observation we have. However, as someone said, in the real line, you can go to infinity in this way or this way. In, complex, in the complex plane, you can go to infinity in a variety of ways. So how does one get rid of this problem? Before that, we would also like infinity times anything to be infinity, any complex number by infinity to be 0. And when z is not 0, we would want zero, uh, z by 0 to be infinity. Now, of course, 0 by 0, we can't make sense of it. We can't make sense of this. We can't make sense of this. We can't make sense of this, and so on, right? But the other things we should, morally speaking, we should be able to make sense of these things. So to make all of this precise, the genius of Riemann was to realize that if one added infinity to the complex plane, it looks like a sphere. In other words, even in the real line, by the way, if I make this plus infinity and minus infinity, if I want to make them both into one single point, I can make it into a circle and say that this is infinity. So in a circle, whether you go like this or this, you're going to the same point. Akin to that, if you take the complex plane and if you go to infinity in all of these directions, I'll take all the directions, I'll, I'll make it into one point and it becomes a sphere. That's called the Riemann sphere, and this is infinity. Very ingenious, right? He completely changed our way of looking at this, this, uh, this the, these concepts. Okay, so let's uh, let's spend a few more minutes. In fact, the rest of this lecture talking about making all of this precise. Uh, Okay, so this is called the Riemann sphere, and it is denoted as C hat, or some people denote it as C union infinity. The, the analog of the Riemann sphere in one variable calculus would be the circle. But we normally don't deal with it in one variable calculus for a very good reason, because the notion of holomorphic doesn't make sense in one variable calculus. That is the thing that makes all of this magic work, as we'll see in a moment. Okay. We can talk about calculus even if you make the real line into a circle, but that's a little more complicated. It's, called, it's the subject of differential geometry. But anyway, okay. ah, so let us make this precise. So by the way, I copied this picture, I think, from Wikipedia. I hope no one catches me for a copyright. But uh, so this is a sphere. This is the equatorial plane. This is supposed to be the complex plane. Equatorial plane. Okay, this is supposed to be our complex plane. Okay, We want to identify the complex plane as a part of the sphere. Okay, And how can we do it? There's a very beautiful way to do it. Just imagine, so this is the North Pole. Imagine there is a torch light, let's assume that there is a laser, maybe a bunch of infinitely many laser pointers. Or maybe let's say there's a torch light. If you shine light on from the North Pole, these light rays would go along the, the straight line path, and uh, they would hit the sphere at some point, right? And they, they, if you extend the straight line, it would also hit the equatorial plane at some point, right? I mean, this is true for any point. If you take this point, if you draw a straight line, it will first hit the equatorial plane and then this uh, and then this point, like for instance, in this, it will first hit the point B and then it will hit the sphere, right? So for all the points, we have a unique, given any point on the sphere, this, if you can trace this array of light, 
and you'll get it exactly you'll get exactly one point on the equatorial plane okay so shine light from the north pole and trace the image of the sphere on the equatorial plane if you do that by the way it's a nice exercise for you to do it it's actually very elementary it's just a matter of very standard high school level three dimensional geometry basically what how do you find out what the what this point here is you take this point it's zero zero one right uh, you take this point at some x y z right and uh, how do you come find out the line joining these two you can use vectors you can subtract this from this to get the vector along this and you can uh, use the vector form of the equation of the line and find out this point of intersection this method of projecting the sphere onto the equatorial plane it's called the stereographic projection now if you remember your high school geography the, the word projection comes up a lot uh, very often in math making okay the standard map that you see of the world where india is a tiny little thing here and i mean what this map is called the mercator projection and this is not a realistic uh, this is not a realistic portrayal of how big countries are russia is the largest country in the world but it's not as large as this and India and Australia are not as small as this. India is one of the largest countries, and so is Australia, right? So the distances are distorted, okay? But anyway, so the stereographic projection is one way to draw a map of the Earth on, the, on paper, by the way. Anyway, so the point x, y, z goes to the complex number x plus i, y divided by 1 minus z. Oh, by the way, this is the unit sphere in the sense that the radius is 1, so x squared plus y squared plus z squared is 1. You can do this as an exercise. Okay, when you give this to your students, you can ask them to do it as an exercise, for instance. So the North Pole, unfortunately, does not go to any where on C, because what is the North Pole? Z equals 1. And there is no complex number that does this, right? In fact, the North Pole doesn't, if you try to do see where the North Pole goes, it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, it has lots of directions where the light goes, but none of them intersect the sphere. None of them intersect the equatorial plane, right? So in a sense, all the directions become the North Pole. So that is why the North Pole should be thought of as infinite. Okay. So this is the relationship between the complex plane and the sphere. The sphere is called the Riemann sphere. And the North Pole should be thought of as the complex number infinite. Right. Now we want to do complex analysis on the Riemann sphere. What does that mean? We want to define the notion of a holomorphic function on the Riemann sphere, for instance. Okay. So if we want to study what happens at the North Pole or at infinity, we must. So, so suppose we want to study the North Pole, right? Then what should we do? We should shine light from the South Pole. Then the North Pole does go to a point, it goes to zero, right? Then the North Pole does go to zero. So we must consider shining light from the South Pole. In that case, you don't get x minus y o, x plus y, i y over 1 minus z, you get x minus y over i y over 1 plus z, which is 1 by alpha. In other words, this complex number, if you take 1 by that, 1 by 0 is infinity, right? That's basically what's going on here. In other words, it's reasonable to require 1 by 0 to be infinity and 1 by infinity to be 0, provided we think of infinity as the north pole of a sphere. Okay? And as always, these quantities are undefined. This you can't do any better. Right? Why is this? Why are they undefined, by the way? Why can't I do some clever geometric trick like this to talk about 0 by 0? Why does 0 by 0 not make sense regardless of how fancy I do things? It will not give uniqueness, right? Yeah, exactly. If I take z by z, as z goes to 0, that is also 0 by 0. But 2z by z is also like that. But this is 1 and this is 2, right? That's the problem. 
Anyway, so moreover, a holomorphic function from the Riemann sphere to itself is defined to be a meromorphic function. By the way, have you heard of the word meromorphic? Have my colleagues done that, Suman? No. Has, or anyone, has the notion of a meromorphic? Meromorphic is not a... That's not been covered? Okay. Yeah. But have poles been covered? Poles and zeros? Uh, essential singularities, poles... Singularities, singularities covered. Singularities have been covered. Okay, very good. So, metamorphic function is a very fancy name for something very simple. A metamorphic function is not a holomorphic function on all of C. It is a holomorphic function at most places on C. But there are singularities, and the singularities are all poles. That is, none of them is an essential singularity. Okay? So, for example, a meromorphic function, near any point, it is a ratio of two holomorphic functions defined over that point. Okay? But basically, they're all poles. The singularities are all poles. Do you know an example of something uh, that has an essential singularity? Any? E power 1 by Z. Yeah. So, E power 1 by Z is not an example of a metamorphic function. What is an example of a metamorphic function? 1, of 1 by Z is 1 by Z times Z minus 1 square, or maybe E raised to Z by Z minus 1 square, etc. These are all metamorphic functions. This is not a metamorphic function. Okay? All right. So, a holomorphic function from the Riemann sphere to itself is simply a metamorphic function such that f of 1 by z is also metamorphic. Okay? So, what's an example? Suppose I take z times z minus 1. This is a metamorphic function. Why? Because it has two poles, that's 0 and 1. They are both poles, right? They are the only singularities. There are no essential singularities. If I replace z by 1 by z, what will happen? And why am I replacing z by 1 by z? Because I want to see what happens near infinity. And to do that, I must invert, right? So if I want to study what happens at infinity, I can just take 1 by z and see what happens at 0. That's the same as saying what happens at infinity. And this is simply uh, z squared divided by 1 minus z. This is also a metamorphic function, right? So a metamorphic function from the Riemann sphere to itself is a metamorphic function from the com a holomorphic function from the Riemann sphere to itself is a metamorphic function from C to C, so that f of 1 by z is also metamorphic. Indeed, given such a function, we simply declare, so what happens to infinity? Suppose I take infinity, what should I do? I should simply say infinity is simply f of 1 by 0. So I said, this is also metamorphic, right? So let's call this g of z. Take g of 0. Okay. Uh, if g of 0, I mean, if g of 0 is something like 1 by 0, then declare it to be infinity. Not a problem. Okay. If it's like 1 by 0, declare it to be infinity. Otherwise, you just take this. Okay. So in other words, if you give me the right kind of a, metamor uh, right kind of a function from c to c, it can extend from to infinity, how you just simply declare that if you whenever you have infinity, uh, just substitute it into your function. If you have one by infinity, you get zero. Uh, otherwise, if you have otherwise, you will probably go to infinity. Likewise, if if you have any pole, a place where you have a singularity which is not an essential singularity, declare that it goes to infinity. That is, one by z minus one square is infinity at z equals one. Just declare it like that. Okay? And that makes sense because of this property. Okay? This is the key point. So example, z goes to az plus b it can be thought of as a function from the Riemann sphere to itself because if I replace z by 1 by z, it's metamorphic. And f of infinity is infinite. Likewise, z goes to 1 by z is also such a function, and f of 0 is infinity, f of infinity is 0. What is a non-example? You can't simply just give examples and be done with it. You should also give a non-example. 
he raised to z is not a function that can be defined on the Riemann sphere. Why? Because e raised to z is holomorphic. No problem. But if I replace z by 1 by z, it has an essential singularity. So what is the problem with an essential singularity? That means this limit does not exist. If I go to infinity, if I take z goes to infinity, this doesn't go to a unique number. Right? Because suppose z is equal to minus x, where x is a real number. Uh, okay? Sorry. Then, as x goes to infinity, this goes to 0. Suppose z is plus x, and then as x goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. Right? So this limit doesn't exist. In this case and this case, the limit does exist. Okay? So that is the genius of Riemann that you can talk certain kinds of functions, namely metamorphic functions, such that f of 1 by z is also metamorphic, such functions can be thought, can be made sense of even at infinity. That is the point. Okay. Right. Well, we technically have five or six minutes, but uh, I'll stop the lecture here.